shape and estabulum, which causes the excessive uh, friction leading to the labral tears and chondral delamination. And this in, in turn gives you the groin pain. The groin pain is mostly on the superolateral aspect of the estabulum rather than the inner or medial groin pain. And the damage to the labral tear and chondral delamination causes early arthritis. If you look at the studies uh, etiology, there are a lot of etiological studies looking at the cause and when this femoroestabular impingement starts. Um, basically, it is the repetitive injury of the proximal femoral physis during the younger age group. That's because of the impact sports, what they do during the development age. The repetitive uh, injury to the physis causes the CAM impingement. It's been proved by different studies and for a couple of studies I have um, noted here. But the, the Mark Philippon and uh, Nepal and Saban Rock, they looked at specific sports activities, including ice hockey, football, and basketball. And they have noted that there is increased prevalence of this CAM impingement development if these players are doing their during their developmental age. If you look at the hip impingement, there are different types of hip impingement. One is the CAM, which I briefly mentioned, which is on the femoral side. And the second one is the pincer, which is on the estabular overgrowth. And the third one is the mixed, combined CAM and mixed. As I mentioned in the previous slide, there are a lot of etiological studies saying that how the CAM impingement is developed, but there is no specific reason why the pincer type of hip impingement develops. There are no studies showing it. However, if you have a coxa profunda hip or a protrusio hip, obviously that causes the pincer type of hip impingement. If you look at the CAM impingement, it is on the femoral side, the head neck junction abnormality, which causes the reduced head neck offset. This causes increased shear forces on the estabular rim, causing damage to the labrum and articular cartilage. If you look at the X-ray, the typical uh, description on the X-ray is like a pistol gun deformity. The estabular side of the impingement is called pincer. This is because of the linear contact between the estabular rim and femoral head neck junction causes the labrum to be ossified. And this results in the deepening of the socket and decreases the range of movement. This in turn causes the damage to the estabular cartilage, especially along the rim of the estabulum, chondrolabral junctions. But if most of the times we see the mixed type of impingement, which is in 80% of the cases, it's both cam and pincer. If you look at the presentation of the symptoms, usually the pain is the main symptom because the labrum is a pain generator. It is highly innervated with the nerves. And I will show you a study where later on where we looked into the innervation of the labrum, which shows anterosuperior and posterosuperior part of the labrum is highly densely impacted, innervated with the nerves. So that is the reason if you have a tear in the labrum in these areas, you get pain. Along with pain, you have associated mechanical symptoms. It could be clicking or it could be giving way or sometimes people will say, patients will say, the hip gets locked in certain positions where they need to move the hip around to unlock it. But be sure that the pain in this type of labral tears, as you can see in the picture, it's on the anterosuperior part of the labrum rather than the inner part of the labrum. Diagnosing by examination is quite straightforward, uh, which is the anterior impingement test. We all do this regularly, uh, even with arthritis patients. It's a flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. In arthritic patients, you have this movement is limited, but in hip impingement patients, you have this movement, flexion, adduction, internal rotation, but the movement is more painful, and it can be reproduced with a click. The second test is the Faber test or 
Patrick's test, where you can see in the second picture, you basically measure the distance between the couch and the knee on the good side and the affected side. And it is quite sensitive and specific test for intraarticular pathology. There are other type of hip impingement tests which we do, which include posterior impingement test. As you can, uh, it's actually Prof. Ganj demonstrating this in the picture, where you bring the patient to the edge of the end of the couch and extend and externally rotate the leg. That shows the posterior impingement test. And there is a iliosoya snapping and ischiofemoral impingement, which can be demonstrated. But another important thing, which we more and more commonly uh, coming into um, light is subspinous impingement. The impingement secondary to the anterior inferior iliac spine. If we're doing arthroscopically, we can see this clearly causing impingement in deep flexion and internal rotation of the hip. Investigations wise, a well-centered AP pelvis and a lateral hip x-ray are uh, very important. When you say well-centered uh, hip you know, pelvic x-ray, uh, the pubic symphysis should be in line with the coccyx within one to three centimeters and equally a demonstrated obturator foramen in equal shapes. And this is the pelvis. You can comment on the retroversion of the estabulum by seeing the uh, ischial spine, and you can comment on the cam and pincer uh, lesions. On the lateral x-ray, again, that's where you comment on the cam type of impingement. You can measure the alpha angle, which is very important, and it's been uh, quite commonly asked in the FRCS exam as well. Um, it is more than 55 of alpha angle, which is the head neck junction. If you can see in the pictures where there is a loss of offset or head neck junction transition is missed, the alpha angle is more than 55 degrees. Again, you look at the head neck offset. If the head neck offset is less than three, nine millimeters, it is abnormal. That suggests it's a cam impingement. The further investigation choice is MR arthrogram. MR arthrogram is quite superior to the MRI scan. MR arthrogram uh, can, uh, on the MR arthrogram, we can easily diagnose the labral tears and chondrolabral separation. But unfortunately, it's not very good to detect the chondral delamination. For chondral delamination, the more specific test is uh, the delayed gadolium enhanced MRI scan, DGEMRIC scan. Not many of the UK centers still have this scan facility, <clears throat> but as you can see in the third picture, the chondral delamination is clearly shown on the DGEMRIC MRI scan compared to the first picture, which is the conventional MRI scan or MR arthrogram because this is an important prognostic factor and how the outcome uh, depends on the chondral delamination. So it's very important to diagnose it. Regarding the MR arthrogram, the validity, we have done a study at St. Helens Hospital, which has been published as well. We looked at about 132 patients uh, who had a hip arthroscopy, and we looked at the labral tears, and the MR arthrogram is relatively accurate compared to intraoperative findings in diagnosing the labral tears and the position of the labral tears. But if you look at the cartilage delamination, it's not very uh, sensitive in diagnosing the cartilage delamination. An MR arthrogram suggested there is no cartilage delamination, but intraoperatively we noted that 78 patients had cartilage delamination. It is very important as it dictates the outcome on the patients. So the sensitivity is not great, but specificity is around 76 from this study. Again, looking at the labral tears from this study, with both sensitivity and specificity is around 84%, and it correlates with the rest of the studies which have been published. So once we investigate and find the diagnosis, the management can be conservative and operative management. The conservative management, mainly activity modification and physiotherapy, uh, doing the gluteal strengthening exercises, 
and then we can consider injections which can help for both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. The operative management is obviously either you can consider an open uh, procedure or hip arthroscopic procedure. There are a couple of uh, studies uh, which you need to know, especially for a first year SATO exam, is a fashion trial, which is one of the largest hip arthroscopy randomized control trial, which was done by the Griffin et al. And there is another one, FATE study, uh, which was published in February last year in BMJ, which was done by the, again, multi-center study, but initiated by the Oxford group. Both these studies looked into the arthroscopic, uh, hip arthroscopy and conservative management in the hip impingement and labral tear patients. At 12 months, the hip arthroscopy group did better with international hip outcome scores and they achieved much higher scores and satisfaction rates. The surgical treatment, as I mentioned, it could be an open surgical hip dislocation or hip arthroscopy. Open surgical uh, uh, hip dislocation is uh, um, demonstrated by the GANJ. Uh, first of all, as you can see in the head neck bump in the left hand side picture compared to the right side where the osteochondroplasty performed. It looks more satisfactory procedure because it's more hands-on and you can have the complete visibility of uh, this one but it is quite traumatic because you do the trochanteric flip osteotomy and also you will put the blood supply to the femoral head in a bit more compromised position. And this is the estabular uh, rim trim, like a pincer excision and a labral repair, which is mostly done the antero superior part of the labrum. There are, uh, this is one of the largest systematic review looking at the outcomes and complication rates uh, with the open surgical dislocation versus arthroscopic and mini open procedures for a hip uh, impingement patients. And the conclusion is with a hip arthroscopy, you have better outcomes and less complication rates compared to the open or mini open. In the open procedures, one of the main complications is the trochanteric non-union. If you go for the hip arthroscopy, the indications are mainly the cam and pincer type of hip impingements and labral tears and loose bodies and any chondral damage. You can deal with these through the hip arthroscopy procedure. The contraindications are very important where you have arthritis uh, of less than two millimeter joint space, then you should try to avoid the arthroscopic procedure and the other uh, contraindications are listed here. The hip arthroscopy, the labral repair and cam resection, you can see it in the pictures. The, as I suggested before, the estabular labrum is the pain generator. And this is another study we have performed uh, looking at the innervation of the labrum and the density of the nerves. And we have noted that the antero superior and postero superior part of the labrum is highly innervated and causes the pain generator. That is why either a debridement of the labrum or repairing the labrum is very important. And also when you are repairing the labrum, you need to be aware of the blood supply. There is no intrinsic blood supply to the labrum, but the capsular side is more uh, vascular zone compared to the inner side, which is the articular side of the labrum. There is another study which is very important uh, regarding the labral repair versus uh, labral debridement. And it's been noted labral repair has uh, better outcomes in long term compared to the labral debridement. This is um, the commonly quoted study, which is Mark Philippons regarding the outcome of the hip arthroscopy. Uh, they looked at the patients with a 10 years outcome and they have noted 34% of the conversion rate to total hip replacements in 10 years who were undergone the hip arthroscopy. When you look at that number, it looks uh, quite dramatic, but if, they, if you look into subcategory of those, this is a, his initial series of the patients and a lot of patients has a joint space of less than two millimeters. That means established arthritis. And those are the patients who had 68% conversion to a total hip replacement within 10 years of the hip arthroscopy procedure. 
However, if you, the joint space is well preserved, in, especially in the non-arthritic patients, the conversion rate is only 2%. Another important factor is the age factor, where above 40 years, the conversion rate is higher into total hip replacement. Again, they looked in particular with the labral debridement and the labral repair, and they noted the labral repair has higher patient satisfaction. So in summary, the hip arthroscopy um, is a very good procedure and uh, with uh, less number of complications and better outcomes, but it is a steep learning curve and you need to make an accurate diagnosis what we are dealing with the hip impingement and the labral tears. And you need to be aware of the extra articular causes and don't be caught out with these. And sometimes you feel, you see the intrasubstance tear with a positive bubble sign on the uh, intraoperatively, but you, that suggests that there is a proper labral tear and you need to repair that as well. So in summary, the hip impingement is a well-recognized problem in the young adults. It's becoming more popular in our regular practice and in the FRCS exams as well. So you need to make an early and accurate diagnosis which can be treated efficiently. This will avoid the early arthritis. Operative management has a better outcomes in long term and arthroscopic approach is better and with less complication rates compared to an open approach. And be aware of the contraindications. Thank you. Good. Uh, thank you, Ravi. That was a nice uh, informative talk. Uh, for the delegates, we will take the questions. If you can um, type them in the chat box, then we can um, try and uh, reply your questions or we will take the questions at the end of all the uh, talks. So without wasting much time, I'll like to invite the next speaker, uh, which is um, uh, Mr. Uh, Nikhil Shah. Uh, he's going to talk to us about um, consenting in total hip replacements, the principles and pitfalls. Uh, I think most of us know Nikhil Shah. He, he's a consultant in um, Brightington Hospital, he has um, a special interest in um, mainly hip, pelvis, uh, trauma and complex scenarios. He is our um, kind of referral person. If you have any trouble, we kind of get to him. Uh, I'm sure um, we will benefit from his, um, his wisdom on consenting and uh, what are the principles to follow. Nikhil, uh, up to you. Thank you, Prakash. Um, can you see the screen? Yeah, I can see the screen. Yeah, I can see the screen and hear it. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Prakash, for a very generous introduction. I don't think I deserve all that. So the purpose of this talk is to look at the principles of consenting within the Montgomery judgment and then apply these principles to your practice when you consent someone for a total hip replacement. Uh, this is quite important for all of us because litigation in relation to consent is on the rise. So we need to understand the basic principles. So what I've done in this talk is in the beginning, we will cover what exactly was the Montgomery judgment. Some of you may already know it. Some of you may not be very familiar to it. And then we will try and apply these principles to a total hip replacement. So until the Montgomery judgment came, the Bolam principle was the guiding principle to decide if someone was negligent. And a doctor would not <clears throat> be guilty of negligence if he has acted in accordance with a practice that is accepted as proper by a reasonable body of medical men who are skilled in that art. This means that if you do something that a reasonable body of doctors also do and they think that it is correct, then you are not negligent. So effectively, a peer or another doctor would decide the, the basis of your practice. Uh, the Bolaito judgment was naturally when we look at treatments for a particular condition, there can be different views. Some people would always put a nail for a fracture. Some people would always put a plate. So what the Bolaito judgment was that a practice that could be logical and defensible would be considered as proper. So if the judge was to choose between two different viewpoints, this is negligent, this is not negligent. You have to defend your viewpoint by giving appropriate evidence and by using logic. So what exactly happened in Montgomery in 2013? So Nadine Montgomery was a diabetic patient. And uh, for those of you who know a little bit of obstetrics or who remember some principles, these patients have got a much higher risk of shoulder dystocia during 
vaginal delivery. So basically, the labor is obstructed. It was a practice of this obstruction not to routinely advise patients of this risk because the likelihood of a very significant complication was quite small. A 0.1% chance of hypoxia and a 0.2% chance of brachial plexus injury. And the doctor felt that if this risk was explained to all patients, they would all choose a cesarean section and that was not necessarily in the best interests of the mother. So this option was not discussed and at planned induction at 39 weeks, unfortunately the worst happened during vaginal delivery. The umbilical cord was obstructed and the baby had very severe disabilities because of a hypoxic bone, uh, brain injury. So the mother naturally claimed that if she had been warned of this risk of shoulder dystocia and the catastrophic uh, consequences, she would have gone for a cesarean section. In the lower courts, they applied the Bolum test and something called the Sidaway judgment. So the Bolum test you already know, a reasonable body of medical opinion actually supported this obstetrician's practice. The Sidaway judgment was for a risk to be significant, it must carry a grave risk of substantial complications. So the original case was actually dismissed by the court that the doctor was not negligent, but the claimant appealed and it went to the Supreme Court. What happened in the Supreme Court? They looked at the entire case and then decided that patients themselves have rights. They have the right to understand what the treatment involves, the right to understand the risks and benefits, and the right to choose their treatment. Treatment is not something that is just given by the medical profession and passively accepted by the patient. So the Supreme Court accepted that if the patient had been appropriately warned, she would have uh, not undergone the labor and uh, she was therefore entitled to damages. So this was a landmark judgment because it changed the way we look at consent. What the judgment said is that the patient should be made aware of any material risks which are involved in the recommended treatment and of reasonable treatment alternatives. And what does material mean? It means something to which a reasonable person would attach significance. So for, for one person, something material may be the risk of a sciatic nerve injury from a hip replacement. For someone else, he might think that heterotopic ossification is more material. For yet a third person, it might be the risk of catching COVID if he goes to the hospital. And not only that, but the doctor should be aware that a particular patient would attach significance to that particular risk. And this is the hard thing. How can we know what a patient might find materially relevant? So the emphasis shifted from the doctor to the patient and consent will now be assessed by the courts, not based on what a reasonable body of medical opinion will think about your consenting, but what a reasonable patient will want to know. And the patient will have the right to choose the treatment option rather than the doctor. Not only that, but no longer will a peer uh, decide on the reasonableness of consent. It will be the court that will decide what is reasonable and not the profession. A doctor's duty is not fulfilled merely by giving percentages to the patient or basically bombarding him with so much information that they simply do not understand, nor by uh, demanding the signature on your consent form. So this is not really what the court would say is informed consent. So what is informed consent then? It starts with your clinic appointment and a dialogue between the patient and the doctor, an explanation of all the reasonable treatment alternatives, including conservative treatment or the risk of doing nothing, and a clear risk and benefit analysis of each of the proposed treatment options. The patient should understand these options properly. So what changed with Montgomery? To be honest, nothing changed. If we look back at what the GMC and the Department of Health told us in 2008 and 9, all these principles were already there. But what the judgment did is it converted these principles into law. It has basically spelled out what we should have been practicing anyway. So for the vast majority of you who were following GMC guidelines, your practices will not really change much. So what does the GMC tell us? What is the doctor's duty? We should focus on the patient and the risks which are specific to them. Find out what concerns them. Find out their individual views. Inform them of any serious and adverse outcomes, even if the risk is small. So the risk of mortality perhaps is small after a routine total hip replacement. But when it materializes, it's a very grave consequence. 
and you must tell them of less serious complications if they are more frequent. Not just that, the risks have to be individualized and we'll come to that in a minute. The Department of Health had also outlined these principles. The option of doing nothing. Do we always discuss conservative treatment with our patients who come with pain? Do we always discuss that there can be alternative treatment and that may include doing nothing and basically just suffering from the pain? Some of us may do that, some of us may not. What are the risks if you do nothing? We should provide a balanced information about the benefits and the risks. Often you will see, and if you reflect upon our consenting processes, if we think we are going to go towards surgery, perhaps we might underplay the risks. If you want to go towards conservative treatment, perhaps you might overplay the risks. What we need to try and do is give a balanced risk, and then we have to find out if the patient really understood it. It's also important to make an appropriate record in the documentation. So let's try and apply these basic principles to consenting for a hip replacement. So look at these x-rays. The x-ray on the left is a very slightly dysplastic hip in a patient who has a lot of pain and no arthritis at all. The x-ray in the middle has a little bit of arthritis, but not really bone on bone. And the third x-ray has got significant bone on bone arthritis. Would you do a total hip replacement for all of these? So what is important is patient selection. And we know from evidence that if you do hip replacements for premature arthritis, which is not bone on bone, the subjective outcomes are very poor. Some of the commonest problems that we see in our Friday morning MDT of patients that are referred into our hospital with painful total hips. And if you look at the original x-rays, you begin to wonder why was the operation done at all? Where is the, where is the grade for arthritis? So make sure you select your patients properly in terms of pain, end stage grade four arthritis, compromised function. Once you have done that, we have to appreciate that the, the, the conversation begins by managing their expectations. Even with a hip replacement, you will be surprised to know that seven to 15% of patients may be quite dissatisfied because of pain or leg length inequality, because they have persistent limping or because of a big complication. It's important to appreciate their comorbidities. And this is where the risk stratification comes in. So part of Montgomery is that the risks should be individualized to the patient. What does that mean? A person who is obese and who has diabetes will have a much higher risk of infection than someone who has normal BMI and does not have diabetes. A person who has stroke or Parkinson's disease will have a higher risk of dislocations. Someone who's had previous hip surgery or previous sepsis or multiple steroid injections may have an increased risk of infection. And these are the factors that you need to find out in your clinic when you take a thorough history and individualize the risks to that patient. If there are any modifiable risk factors, it's important we correct them so as to improve our outcomes. Because that's what Montgomery told us, focus on the individual patient and the risks that are specific to them. So coming back to our treatment options, what are the treatment options for arthritis of the hip joint? Will everyone be offered a hip replacement? or is conservative treatment a very valid option? So that is the option of doing nothing. And what I tend to do with my patients is discuss the ladder of treatment, starting from the simplest thing, the option of doing nothing, conservative treatment, which includes weight loss, injecting the hip joint. Some of us may not believe in the concept that hip arthroscopy is indicated at all, if you see any arthritis on the x-ray, but there may be another viewpoint where they would offer a hip arthroscopy even in arthritic hips. And whatever your philosophy is that you can justify, that's part of your treatment ladder. And then finally, we go to surgery. Once you have discussed the options, it's very important to discuss the prosthetic options. What type of a hip are you going to do? And is that option backed by sound evidence? Are you going to do a fully cemented or a hybrid or an uncemented or what bearing are you going to use? Believe me, each of these slides that I have put in, I have dealt with as a negligence claim. So none of this is a figment of my imagination, but over all these points, there are doctors in the UK who have been sued. And then we come to discussing the risks, starting with the worst case scenario first, perhaps a risk of mortality from a variety of different problems, a risk of thromboembolic um, complications. Then the usual risk of infection, dislocation, leg length problems, damage to the nerves, some of the rarer risks like abductor tendon injury perhaps, or a grade four heterotopic ossification, and then the long-term risks. You also have to try and explain to them the worst case scenario, that if the hip does get infected and you cannot solve it with a DARE procedure and you do a one-stage or a two-stage revision, 
and it remains infected, what's the worst thing that could happen to them? They might end up with a girdle stone excision. They might actually lose the limb. I hope that joint for deep infection, it's a very unpleasant experience. Very rare, but when it does happen, it's a complete devastation for that patient. And then in the modern scenario, the risks of the environment. You have to try and stratify these risks to your individual patient. Someone whose ejection fraction is only 30 and you're going to do a hip replacement on him, his mortality risk will be much higher than who is fit for surgery. And now this is one thing that we tend not to pay so much attention to, consequences of, of the risks. And I have done several cases uh, in the, that there is a risk of injury to the sciatic nerve, but I don't know what it means. I don't know what is neuropathic pain. I did not know what a foot drop is. Doctor never told me that I would not be able to climb a ladder or I, or, or I would lose my job. So it's important that you actually explain the consequences of those risks to the patient. What exactly happens if you end up with a girdle stone? What exactly happens if you have to have a hip disarticulation or if it's a knee replacement and above the knee amputation? Make sure that your patient then understands these risks. And this is again a very important part of informed consent of positive feedback that the patient has understood the risks and has therefore made uh, an, and has selected actively the operation. And this is sometimes something that a lot of us may, uh, may not have in our consent. So this is a simple uh, uh, dissemination of information. You have a discussion in the clinic, you copy your letter to the patient. Most hospitals have joint classes and information booklets. Uh, the information can be given in electronic or digital formats. Many consultants have their own private websites. Hospitals have their own private websites. And then once you've done that, you have to determine, does the patient understand the options? Does he understand the risks? Have you given him enough time to think? And have you answered all his questions? Increasingly, it is difficult to be able to list a patient in the first clinic itself without actually giving them time to think. It has be, uh, been tested in court and unfortunately, the, the, the courts have found that the doctor did not give the patient enough time to think and listed him in the first go. The patient thought that that is the only option available and unfortunately, the doctor lost the case. Then you make sure that you document this process appropriately. Okay, this is very, very important. If it wasn't documented, it wasn't done. The importance of documentation is because the patient can then read your letter and reflect upon it. You can then defend yourself if you were challenged that you have, you have not taken a proper consent. And most important, you have to be able to capture the evidence of the whole process of consenting rather than the end point, which is just the yellow form on which the patient signs. So this is the GMC four step model of obtaining informed consent. And we've already covered all of these points before. Make an assessment of the patient's views, his characteristics, his knowledge, his attitudes towards risk. Then decide based on your expertise and judgment, what investigations or treatment are likely to benefit him. And out of these, which options are better, which options are not very good. Explain all of these options to the patient and give a balanced assessment of the risks and benefits of each of these treatment options including the option of doing nothing. Then give the patient a chance to think about this and let him come back to you and tell you that he's understood everything and this is the option that he wants. Some may say, I don't want surgery. Some may say, give me a hip replacement. You can't really give excuses anymore. You know, I, it was too busy in the clinic. You know, there are, there are 17 risks. I can't really talk to my patients about all these 17 cases. I've, I've mentioned the main important things my trust does not allow me to have a separate consent clinic. It spoils my new to follow up ratio. I, I did explain to the patient because I always do. That's my routine practice, but I didn't bother because I only do three line letters instead of a one page letter. I didn't tell the patient everything because I didn't want to make the elderly lady too anxious. And then finally, with the patient has signed the form and I've written everything on the form. So that means I've obtained consent. None of these excuses will stand um, in court. So these are 12 commandments of consenting that I hope that I've um, borrowed from, um, from the famous movie. The first is that consenting is a process. Leave adequate time for the patient to understand what you're telling them and to reflect upon the consent. Document the advice correctly. Discuss the option of conservative treatment in every case where it is relevant and record it. Don't overestimate the success, especially if it's independent sector practice. And I've seen several examples of negligence cases where the success rate was vastly overestimated 
and um, the complication the risk was vastly underestimated. Advise the patients of all material risks that he may find important or relevant to himself or herself. Provide information that is specific to that patient. Risk stratification. Understand the attitudes towards risks and ask them, what do you feel? What would you do if this happens to you? How would you cope if, if you get an infection in your hip replacement? Don't rush into performing surgery, especially if it is elective surgery. If your patient is in doubt, it is better to give them a chance to think and then follow it up with a phone call or another letter or a second appointment if they still have questions. There is no longer an excuse that you can't organize follow-up appointments or you're too busy. Give the patients the chance to reflect and the chance to change their mind. Don't force surgery upon them. Give them a chance to ask more questions. Avoid consenting on the day of surgery. Okay, and I recently did a case where the process was followed and the consent was taken on the day of surgery. And I actually thought that the case was defensible, but the trust actually accepted liability. Keep good records and then use your clinic letters to demonstrate that you have given appropriate advice to the patient and that consenting is a process and not a point in time. So to summarize, consent is important and now it is a legal requirement. We can borrow the principles of Montgomery to consent for a hip replacement. And I'm sure that you can borrow these principles to whatever your practices are, upper limb, lower limb, knee replacement, hip arthroscopy. Consent is a shared decision making. It's not your choice anymore. It's the patient's choice. The risks have to be individualized to the patient and focus on the pathway and capture the evidence that you have a pathway, not just the signature on the form. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. There was a lot of insight into consenting. Uh, I'm sure it would uh, apply to all of us in our day-to-day -day practice uh, across the specialities. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll, there are a lot of questions uh, on this uh, talk. We'll probably take it at the end. So now we'll move on to the next talk, which is uh, by Mr. Kuntal Patel. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, hip replacements in um, secondary osteoarthritis or special um, circumstances. Uh, Kuntal um, is a good friend of mine. He works in Lancashire Teaching University Hospital. He specializes mainly in hip surgeries. His practice is mainly revision work. And I'm sure um, he, his knowledge would be uh, very well received. Kuntal? It's uh, for you to share your screen, please. Thank you, Prakash. Uh, can you see the screen all right? Yeah, we can see the screen and hear you. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay. Uh, morning, everyone. I'm going to go through um, total hip replacement for secondary arthritis, essentially complex primary hip replacement. So essentially, I'll start off with door classification uh, for the femur. I feel it's very important um, for uh, selecting your processes and how you uh, do the steps for doing the stem. Um, and then I'm, I'll go on to some individual cases like Paget's, DDH, uh, previous proximal femur uh, deformities, uh, post-traumatic cases, especially failed fixations. You, you, you'll see quite a few in your practice and um, you actually get some clinical cases in FRCS off as well. So I think you, you'll find this quite useful. And then I'll, I'll touch on things like uh, essentially take down of hip, uh, uh, hip arthrodesis, but that's thankfully not very common. Okay, so let's go on door classification. So uh, I, would, I would certainly urge all trainees uh, to, to look into this when you uh, are doing your pre-op planning for hip replacement surgery. So a lot of the cases would be door B. That's probably the commonest uh, uh, in my experience and based on the, on the evidence, uh, but certainly beware of door A femur and door C femur. Now, the, if you don't spot this, the difficulty is if it's a door A femur, what you are likely to get is a diaphysal fit uh, and you could undersize the stem and thereby these are the patients who will get uh, thigh pain. Um, so the, the trick here is to make sure a you've identified it and secondly you you address it and the way to address that would be to ream the femur actually and then broach it uh, depending on whether you're using uncemented stem or cemented stem uh, uh, that's probably your discretion but you make sure that there is a diaphysal metaphysal fit and not just a diaphysal fit 
uh, and equally indoor uh, C femur. Um, this is where the cortices are really thin and I certainly would urge you to consider using a cemented processes um, as compared to a very large oversized uncemented processes. Um, whereas with door B, uh, you should have both options available. Okay, let's just go into some individual conditions. So let's look at Paget's disease. Um, so if you look at this x-ray, you can clearly see the bony architecture on the right hip. Um, and that should uh, really uh, signal alarm bells to say, right, what is going on with this patient? And you should take a full medical history in terms of uh, not just their, uh, their hip pain, as, as Nikhil mentioned in the previous talk about how bad their hip arthritis is, how bad their symptoms are. But then you need to take the full medical history in terms of uh, um, how well controlled their pagets is, are they on any medications. Um, and then it's very important that uh, you do uh, full leg uh, films uh, of, uh, you know, long leg films of the whole lower limb so you can assess the deformity. And more importantly, uh, if you're in doubt, uh, you should get a CT scanogram from the hip to the ankles. Uh, you should get a lateral view as well because the challenges here are um, femoral deformity in AP and lateral planes. The bone is quite tough, uh, so it's quite a sclerotic bone uh, and hence bony resection, reaming and broaching is gonna be very difficult and challenging. There's also a higher risk of aseptic loosening. So the tips are make sure you have long leg films um, and a CT scanogram if you do not have long leg films available in your hospital. Uh, you have to plan deformity correction. So this is your, your pre-op planning. You have to measure the angles and see whether or not you can get away uh, with, uh, with a standard stem or whether you need to do a proximal femoral osteotomy um, in AP and lateral planes. Uh, as I mentioned before, these patients uh, bleed more than normal, so you have to consider cell salvage. Um, there are some studies to show that uncemented implants actually work better in Pages disease. Uh, it's not proven beyond doubt, but certainly I would, I would consider that. And, and this is what we did in this case, we needed, needed uh, deformity correction um, and uh, processes. Okay, so let's go into DDH. So obviously this is quite an extreme case. Um, and, and just to highlight how, how bad a DDH case can be. So it's clearly a high DDH. Uh, so let's go into some classification for DDH first. So one of the common ones is a crow classification. Um, I'm sure you would have come across this before. And as you can see from crow one to crow four, um, the proximal uh, displacement of the head um, and the femur uh, keeps increasing. And clearly the femoral head subluxation increases as well. So the, the case I just showed you before is a clearly a crow four with significant proximal uh, displacement and a femoral head um, that is fully dislocated. Uh, what I also find useful actually is this next classification, which actually guides your management. So you could go on from a dysplasia to a low dislocation to a high dislocation. So let's think about this for a minute. So the dysplasia is a subtype A, and that actually is probably the commonest, hopefully you'll see in, in your practice. And that's because of good management of uh, uh, DDS screening, uh, followed by public harness. Um, so, you know, the ma management by our pediatric orthopedic colleagues has been great. And hence, hence, a lot of the adult hip practice we'll see is the dysplastic hips with some shallowing of their stablum. Now, in this case, hopefully you can get away with your normal processes, uh, cemented or uncemented cup, and, and hopefully you don't, don't need to worry much about, about the femur either. The low dislocation cases, B1, are where the false acetabulum still covers more than 50% of the true acetabulum. Uh, and these are where you need to reconstruct the roof of the acetabulum, but they are still relatively easy. And you could use the femoral head as, a, uh, as an autograft and reconstruct the superior uh, roof of the acetabulum. And then from B2, C1 and C2, these are the really difficult ones where there's significant lack of coverage of the acetabulum uh, or that it's a very high dislocation where actually there is no acetabulum. So make sure you've done this. 
So what are the challenges? Now, even when you have the type A or the B1 that I just mentioned before, um, make sure you have done adequate pre-op planning because these are the patients who have excessive femoral neck antiversion. So if you've not planned this, what will happen is your stem, which you often put parallel to the neck, would be in excessive antiversion. These are the patients who have valgus neck shaft angle. So therefore, you have to do your leg length discrepancy or leg length equalization measures. Uh, you have to use these very, very carefully. There's hypoplastic intramedullary canal. There is rotational mismatch between the metaphysis and the diaphysis. This contracture of the abductors, especially higher the dis dis dislocation, uh, the tighter the abductors are. So you may need to do some subperiosal release of the abductors. Uh, you have to plan for shallow acetabulum or acetabular deficiency uh, and how are you going to reconstruct it. And most importantly, this excessive acetabular antiversion as well, and that has to be part of your pre-op planning. So if you're not careful, native antiversion of the femur is excessive and this excessive acetabular antiversion as well. And therefore, if you, in, in this case, if you line up your acetabulum parallel to the TAL, and if you line up your femoral uh, stem antiversion parallel to the neck, as you would do in a primary total hip in most cases, your combined antiversion could be as much as 50 to 60 degrees, and that has a very high risk of anterior dislocation in these cases. So what are the tips? So um, this is obviously a talk in itself, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly go through some salient principles. So you need to have, uh, you need to go through rigmarole of five steps of pre-op planning. You have to evaluate the pre-op leg limb discrepancy and look at all the measures you're gonna try and correct that. Second, you need to look at relocating the hip center. So if it's a type B2, C1 or C2, how are you gonna bring the center down? Where is a true hip center? What is the difference in the leg lens and how are you gonna bring it back down to the hip center? You need to predict the use of shortening osteotomy. So you need to think, um, um, what's uh, the sort of leg limb discrepancy and how much we need to uh, shorten the femur. You need to choose your appropriate implants based on your pre-op planning and whether or not you need uh, modular stems and you need to achieve primary stability uh, and make sure your combined antiversion is not excessive. So this uh, is what we've done in the case I've just shown you before. The, the cup, we managed to bring it down but clearly we needed to do a shortening femoral osteotomy. And this is a case of uh, a low DDH where you could see it's, it's a B1 uh, where um, the pseudoacetabulum is still 50, uh, more than 50% coverage with the true acetabulum. Here we could use the femoral head autograft um, to reconstruct the superior acetabulum. We've used that to screw that in. The other options you could have is you can use the metal augments like typhoon augments, TM augments. Um, but generally bear in mind, these are younger patients and therefore autograft would be much better to re reconstitute their bone stock as compared to going for more metal. Okay, just on similar, similar themes, I'll just show you this case where you would see a lot of young adults who've had uh, proximal femoral osteotomies, acetabular osteotomies uh, as a kid by the pediatric orthopedic surgeons. And you, you get a case like that where you've got bilateral proximal femoral uh, deformity. Now, when you get a case like that with a, the, the x-ray on the left where you've just got a pelvis x-ray, you need to make sure you've got the full length femur x-rays. Uh, you want to make sure you've got AP and lateral views. And ideally, you want a, a long leg film or a CT scanogram. Um, and then what what are the challenges? So, well, you need to make sure you can map the deformity and that's in three dimension. Um, you need to have, you need to get the center of rotation angulation, which is called the Cora. Uh, the deformity surgeons, uh, deformity correction surgeons use this on a regular basis. Um, you then need to think, is the deformity bad enough uh, to, to need a corrective osteotomy? and whether you can get away with a short stem versus a standard stem. Now, in, in my practice, I've never been really convinced using the mini stems or the mini hip or the short stems, as you call it. Uh, 
Lots of companies make it, uh, but you have to think whether that's something you're happy with. Um, now, the advantage of that would be that you can uh, get away without a massive corrective osteotomy. Um, and clearly you want to correct or manage the lignum discrepancy. And this is what we did in this case. We corrected the deformity and we've used, this is an SROM stem, but the advantage of, of this is um, when there's a metaphyseal diaphyseal mismatch, you need the modularity in your stem to address both of these issues. I'm just gonna go through some trauma cases because they are often the cases where you get secondary arthritis. So let's look at this case. It's a clear subtroc non-union. Uh, this patient, this x-ray is 11 months down the line following the initial fixation, known case of rheumatoid arthritis, was on lots of disease-modifying drugs. Clearly, there's no callus and, and it's a biological failure. So the issues here were, well, do you refix or do you think arthroplasty? You, clearly, there's prox, you know, poor proximal femoral bone stock. You need to think about the greater and lesser trochanter because they were commutated. And if you were to replace it, do you use a calca replacing stem or do you use a proximal femur replacement? Okay, so here uh, it was a biological uh, uh, failure. So refixation was not an option we were considering. And when we went in the whole prox, we were thinking of calca replacing stem, but there was too much combination. Um, and really we went for a proximal femur replacement. Let's look at this. Now, it's a similar uh, x-ray in, in terms of implant failure. It's a failed DHS fixation. Looks like a transverse type uh, subtroc fracture. Um, it's a you know, greater trochanter, partly united, lesser troc has united. Some of the screws have broken. So in your prior planning, you need, you need to think here, right, do I need, uh, do I have enough proximal femoral bone stock? Um, and hopefully the answer seems yes, and I don't think we need to be as drastic and think of a proximal femur replacement here. Um, the question is, can you refix that? Personally, I, I do not feel much merit in refixing. There's a lot of resorption of the, of the femoral neck, and hence a replacement would be the preferred option here. And this is what we went for. So we did a, a, a cone conical stem, which is a, a calca replacing stem, and we reattached a greater potential to it. And another similar example where it's a failed nail, the screws have backed out, the femoral neck uh, is resorbed or re uh, you know, it's not fully healed, certainly. Um, and another one where we did not feel there was enough bone stock within the femoral head to refix that. Um, so if, if you get cases like this in the exam, think um, uh, in your FRCS auth uh, viva, you need to think your rationale for refixation versus replacement and, and that will de determine on the bone stock and is it a mechanical failure or biological failure? And then you can advise your decision. So here again, it was a replacement as you can see uh, because there was not enough in the, in the femoral head and we could reserve the proximal femur. And then a couple of simple or relatively simpler cases where it's a AVN secondary to cannulated screw fixation. Uh, as you can see here, uh, but the, the femur, there's no major deformity, neither it's in the acetabulum, so we've managed to get away with a standard cemented total hip replacement. Um, now, th there are some papers of cemented versus uncemented uh, when it's a failed DHS or a failed uh, cannulated screw. Uh, there are pros and cons of both options. The, the difficulties here are when there are screw holes, do you get adequate cementation? Do you get adequate pressurization? And generally the answer is yes, you can, you can do that you'll need to block the, the holes while cementing. And equally, this is an example where we used, used an uncemented stem. Okay, so I'll go on to a couple of more challenging cases now. Take down of hip arthrodesis. Um, it's not something, thankfully, we see commonly. Uh, it used to be a, a thing of the past where, uh, you know, hip arthrodesis was reasonably commonly done a few years ago. So we still see some patients lurking around with this. The, the, the difficulty they get is clearly no pain from that hip, but they get pain from the contralateral hip and they get severe back pain and ipsilateral knee pain. Now, if, if you were to consider taking down a hip arthrosis, um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in exam scenario, you should really say this should be by a dedicated hip surgeon or a revision hip surgeon uh, 
uh, but the principles would be that the challenges are the significant going to be significant shortening of the leg. You need to assess the status of abductors, and and that generally is through an MRI scan, and and you can do nerve conduction studies. Um, you need to assess uh, the the quality of uh, uh, of of your femoral, uh, you know, the bone stock of the femur, the acetabulum. You, you obviously have to reset uh, into the neck. Um, in situ and then recreate that by, by reaming through it. And more often than not, you'll need to do a shortening osteotomy. And, and this is what we did in this case. Okay, I'll just uh, uh, leave you pondering on these couple of interesting cases. Uh, it's a, a case of osteopetrosis, marble bone disease with the previous uh, osteotomy. So again, imagine doing a hip for a case like this. Um, it'll be really, really challenging. But um, and another case where uh, on the left, uh, a hip arthrodesis, you know, hard, you know, so difficult to judge the anatomy here, plus a, a broken, uh, some sort of nail uh, device. Um, and again, you know, it'll be a logistical nightmare. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Kuntal. Um, that was uh, quite a complex scenario. I think most of these cases are quite complex, you know, they probably for exam purposes, but you would always say that you would involve somebody more uh, uh, interested in revision work to have, take upon these cases rather than, you know, jumping on them. Of course. For the uh, exam purposes. Uh, thank you, Kuntal. So for our uh, last talk, I would like to um, invite uh, Mr. Nikhil Pradhan. Uh, he's, he's a colleague of mine uh, based at Warrington and Alton University. He has an extensive revision practice, a peripheral uh, fracture. Uh, I'll get it straight to Nikhil to uh, listen to what he has to say. Nikhil, uh, do you want to share your screen? So we'll see that. Yeah, sure, Prakash. Sharing uh, my screen now. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks Prakash and thanks Bios uh, for inviting me for this talk. I'll try and uh, entertain you for uh, 15 minutes with periprosthetic fractures. Um, if you look at the prevalence, then quoted in literature, it varies from about 0.5 to 3.9%. A bit of a technical slide, but we are between Halloween and Diwali, so I'll not make any excuses here. But what you can see is, the difference between intra-op and post-op, you can see that the risk for a primary cemented hip is 0.1% compared to an uncemented hip, which is 3.9%. So you've got to be careful of your technique when you're doing an uncemented uh, total hip. And when you look at the risk in revisions, it is 14% with an uncemented revision. When we look at the post-op periprosthetic fractures, then the risk is 0.6% in primaries, and it's pretty similar between cemented and uncemented total hip replacements. And these are the figures from the Mayo Clinic where they've looked at around 24,000 uh, cases of hip and revision hips. So if we then move on to post-operative periprosthetic fractures, and we look at various papers, we find that overall 70 to 94% of type B fractures have a loose stem with osteolysis. And this is looking at the Swedish, Swedish registry and the Mayo Clinic and some papers. 93% have minor trauma or fall. So this is not something that you see with major trauma. And seven to eight years is the routine sort of follow-up time from a primary hip when you see these fractures. Though I must say this trend is changing and I'll take you through that. That does not seem to be a significant change uh, between uh, males and females and the BMI does not seem to affect uh, periprosthetic fractures a lot. So why is it important to look at periprosthetic fractures and what is the impact of periprosthetic fractures on mortality rate? So looking at the Swedish registry, when they looked at revisions for periprosthetic fractures versus revisions for other causes, there's a higher rate of mortality when you're doing revision surgery for periprosthetic fractures. Furthermore, a very good paper in 2007 by Bhattacharya et al, 
states that the mortality rate is 11% at one year for periprosthetic fractures. Now compare that with primary hips, which in the same paper is quoted as 2.9%, and in fracture neck of femurs at 16.5% at one year. So you can see that periprosthetic fractures do have a high mortality rate at one year. And another interesting finding from the same paper, and I shall uh, go back to this as we go through the slides, is there's a threefold increase in mortality rate in patients who sustained a fracture at the level of the prosthesis, which are talking about type B fractures, that were treated with an open reduction internal fixation versus those treated with revision arthroplasty. The most commonly used classification is the Vancouver classification. There are modifications of this. You have type A, B, and C. Type A has greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. And then again, the subtypes between this will be what is the displacement? Is it uh, less than one centimeter or more than one centimeter? B1 is with a well-fixed stem. B2 is with a loose stem and B3 is with poor bone stock. And C is where the fracture is distal to the stem, the implant or the cement implant composite. Apart from the routine investigations, I would say that we need to look at UTI if these patients are most likely elderly patients coming from nursing homes, remember to look into that. Look for ESR and CRP or essentially inflammatory markers to see if there's an infection. Check DVT as we found that these patients are, again, elderly patients. Have they been immobile for a while? And are you going to think about what happens post-op as well? If it's an unwitnessed fall, especially coming from a nursing home, do your initial check for a head injury. If in doubt, get a CT scan done. Now in Case of how do you investigate the fracture itself? The fracture pattern is extremely important. And I would suggest that all of these patients need a CT scan. I would suggest an MDT and whether it's a radiology department MDT or a discussion with your colleague to decide this is your plan for this particular periprosthetic fracture. It is useful. And if these patients are elderly, then discussing it with your anesthetist before you actually bring this patient to theaters it's not a good, bad idea. So what patient's variables should we consider? And do they have an impact on how you treat these patients on their outcomes? And most papers now quote that the physiological aid, uh, physiological aid is important when deciding what is the outcome? What was the pre-op mobility status? What are the comorbidities? What bone stock is available? And what is the healing potential of this bone? Have you got osteolysis? Is the stem loose with osteolysis, thin cortices? Is this going to be a difficult one to fix? Is there osteoporosis? Which means, are you going to get good fixation if you're going to try and fix this fracture? Previous surgeries also make sense. What I would say to you is, think fracture neck of femurs. We are very well averse when we look at fracture neck of femurs, we think about pain relief, stability, early mobilization. I would say translate those principles to periprosthetic fractures and you'll probably head in the right direction. There's been a slight change in trend. In the previous years, periprosthetic fractures came with osteolysis, loosening, and then the fracture. What we are seeing with improved survival of cemented and uncemented stems and increasing life expectancy is an increasing trend of fractures with osteoporotic bones. And hence, it's not very easy to achieve good stable fixation. Remember, there's always gonna be a race when you fix these fractures between failure of your fixation and fracture healing. So let's go through the classification. If you get an intraoperative type A fracture, you should ideally fix it consider protective weight bearing. If it's post-operative and it's displaced more than one centimeter, sorry, less than one centimeter, protected weight bearing, giving a walking aid will probably allow this to heal. If it's more than one centimeter displacement, consider fixation. 
unless of course you're dealing with a really elderly patient and the patient expectations are low. I shall jump to the type 2B, I'll come to the type B1 as we go further. So type 2B is a loose stem, you've got good proximal bone quality and the decision here is normally to revise this. Now, when you consider revision, you're going to consider what are the variables here? Is this an elderly frail patient? Am I revising a cemented stem? Now, it might be worthwhile to think, do I need to remove all of that proximal cement? Can I go in there, take the stem out, reduce the fracture and use a long cemented stem and get away in an elderly frail patient, full weight bearing mobilization, get this patient back on their feet. If it is a young patient with a cemented stem, think about it. Do you need to remove all the cement? If you need to remove the cement, do you need to consider an ETO? You'd rather do an ETO to start with than go after the cement and then find that you've split the femur in a way that's not controlled. Do you need to consider for long cementless stems? So pre-op planning on all this is important. If you are on a type um, three, which is a loose stem, but the quality of bone is poor, then really you need to think of distal fixation. So now you're saying, I want to achieve rotational stability, good distal hold, maybe with locking screws and salvage this patient. So let me now take you back to the B1, which is a well-fixed stem. And what are the treatment options? Now, remember that 70 to 94% of patients in type B have a loose stem. So when you see a B1, I would say, think about it, look at your CD scans, make sure you're looking at a B1 and not a B2. Then look at the fracture pattern and the age of the patient. So if you've got a long spiral or an oblique fracture, much better to fix this full weight bearing mobilization. Now, when you say fixation, it's extremely crucial that you plan your fixation well. Where does this fracture end? Is there a way that I can have screws that are in the proximal fragment, which will give me a good hold? I would always consider a double plating, a plate which is lateral and a plate which is anterior. Try and achieve compression at the fracture site and think about how are you going to position your plates and your screws so as to get good purchase on bone. And if you were just to go blindly into this, you'll find that the risk of failure of refixation is very high. If you get a B1 which is well fixed and the fracture pattern is a short oblique or transverse fracture, the patient is an elderly patient minor fall, think about, is there osteoporosis? Am I really going to manage to fix this well and get good hold? And if you're in doubt with this, it's not a bad option to say that I'm going to revise this despite a well-fixed stem and get early mobilization on this patient. So if you've got a B1, and this is a case where I say that you've got Again, a short oblique fracture. Look at the fracture edges. Is it sclerotic? Are you looking at a stress fracture? Again, think about what is the healing potential of this bone? Am I going to consider going in for a revision? Because remember, again, Bhattacharya in his paper quoted that there's an increased risk of mortality, three times increased risk for fixation compared to revision. The type C, a well-fixed stem, distal fracture, you need to fix. You can fix this if you can get a good reduction with a single plate with good compression. Okay, let me take you through some quick examples. So this is a type A. You can see on the x-ray to your left that you've got a small intraoperative trochanteric incomplete fracture, which has been caused when this so has cut across at the neck. Postoperatively, this patient is mobilized, complains of pain, and the check x-ray shows that the fracture is now complete. This is less than one centimeter displaced, 
you treat it conservatively and it heals and the patient does well. This is the type B1 that I said that you need to be careful and you need to look into what are you dealing with. Because again, this is a B1 because you've got cement which is dist in the distal fragment and I consider that as a composite implant where you've got the implant and the cement there. Look at the edges. Are these edges sclerotic? Is this a stress fracture? And think about what is the healing potential of the bone? The endosteal healing, you've got cement there. So all of that needs to come out. Then go to strip all of the periosteum to put a double plate. Are you going to get good fixation? So think about all of this before you fix it. This was fixed. A single plate, lateral side, good distal hold. Can't be sure of the proximal hold. And is there good compression at the fracture side? Now, it's difficult to comment on a two-dimensional x-ray, but you might say that this could have been compressed better. There's always a race between healing of the fracture and the implant. And then you end up with the fracture. And now you've got, again, an elderly patient You've got a scenario where is this infected? So you go through all of that and then eventually you revise this. This was revised to a um, uncemented distally locked implant and the patient did well. But you've got to consider all of this before you consider fixation or revision and your technique of fixation has to be, I think, absolutely crucial. This is an x-ray. Again, you're saying, is this a B1 or a B2, uncemented prosthesis? And one of the, I would say, diagnostic things here is look at where the implant is. It's well within the distal fragment and you've got displacement of the proximal fragment. This is more likely to be a B2 because you've got displacement of the proximal fragment here. Worthwhile getting a CT scan done, as I said, on all of these patients. And you can see, the fracture extends posteriorly all the way up and this patient needs a revision. Elderly flare, flare patient who had an uncemented prosthesis, you can get a good reduction, put a cemented stem and these patients can do well. If it's a young patient with a B2 fracture, so this was a hybrid uh, fixation, cemented stem, uncemented cup, these are the post-op x-rays, Patients did, this patient did very well. I think it was about three years down the line that he came off his push bike and fell and this was his fracture. So you're looking at what is the fracture pattern here? Again, get a CT scan. How many fragments? Where is the cement? And then what is your plan? Are you going for a cemented or an uncemented revision? Think about how are you going to remove the cement? You've got an ETO that's already done for you. And then you can go in, plan your revision, fix it. And then with protected weight bearing in this patient, you can achieve good healing. This is a B2, an uncemented stem. Again, here, no collar out there. And you can see this has sustained a fracture. This was about seven years post-op. And this has been fixed. You can see here it's a distally well-fixed stem and then the fracture has been wrapped around the stem and um, healing has been achieved. A slightly complex C3 fractures, you'll see more and more of these as um, you um, go through um, patients who are rheumatoids. So knee replacement distally, there's a complex fracture in a rheumatoid and there's a revision surgery on the top. So this was fixed with a single plate using minimal uh, invasive surgery in a way to try and uh, protect um, the uh, healing potential of the bone and um, went on to heal. And you can see there are clips here which are suggestive that this patient was given um, some sort of exigent treatment. Some people call it voodoo science, but it seems to work in some people's hands. An interesting one, and I think you might start seeing these um, as um, you look at the next five, 10 years. Primary hip replacement, this is one of my patients done in 2011. 
and this was the x-ray 2020 post uh, post uh, surgery and then the patient came uh, to mr chandran with uh, pain in the thigh and the x-ray revealed a small nodule sort of thing and when you take a close up of that you can see that there is a stress fracture developing there now these are bisphosphonate fractures and you've got to be very careful with these and this will be the new sort of um, conundrum that orthopedic surgeons will have to deal with in periprosthetic fractures. So uh, a CT scan was done to plan exactly how far, far away this uh, fracture is from the tip of the prosthesis. Where can you get in screws? Can you get one or two screws out here? Now, unfortunately, while we were waiting for planning this surgery, the patient has a fall. And the patient then came with this periprosthetic fracture. And you can see there now sclerotic edges, short fracture. So remember, when you see a fracture, even though it is a complete fracture, think about, is it a stress fracture? Have you got sclerotic edges? Now this was fixed, and I must say, Mr. Chandran has done a fantastic job, as you can see. He's achieved compression, but he's also achieved to get two screws in the um, proximal fragment, double plating, and um, hopefully, this will go on to heal. This was literally done uh, last month. Okay, to summarize, I would say that 80 to 90% of prostheses are loose in type B fractures. So remember, think about B2, consider revision. When you are in your exams, think about fracture pattern, patient factors, healing potential. Think fracture neck of femur, elderly patients, one operation, you want to achieve stability and mobilize full weight bearing. And as I said, watch out for the B1. If you are going for fixation, think about double plating, compression at the fracture side, plan the placement of your screws and plate. If in doubt of healing potential or bone stock, think about revision. And I would stress again in your exams that you're talking about MDT meetings, team approach with an anesthetist, your scrub team, the kit that you have, and medical backup, especially with patients who have multiple comorbidities. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. That was quite uh, extensive. You covered all the uh, scenarios for uh, so, uh, 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 the complex ones, uh, good for the exam purposes. Now going on, I think I'm very conscious we are slightly over running on time. I, and most of the questions which have been asked by the Delegates have been answered, I can see in the chat box. I think there are one or two which probably would benefit from uh, being explained in more detail. Uh, first one is to, to Mr. Nikhil Shah. There is a question on uh, consenting in virtual clinics. You know, does it change practice or do we just carry on as how we do normally? What is your view on that? Uh, last year, I took part in a clinical negligence conference with some barristers in Leeds in September 2019. And uh, both the QCs that were there, we discussed this quite extensively. And I don't remember the name of the judgment, but I'll try and dig it out for you. But this point has been tested in the court and the judge accepted that in the modern world when everything is virtual and uh, it's a perfectly reasonable way of communication, there is no reason at all why, um, why a virtual communication cannot be allowed so long as you have actually seen the patient at least once before clinically and examined the patient to make sure that surgery is the right option. I think I will feel very reluctant to see a new patient with primary hip arthritis uh, on Zoom TV and list him directly for a hip replacement. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one more question now for you, Nikhil. Um, this is from... Uh, from I can't remember the name. The, the question is, you know, when you're doing trauma cases, obviously it's sometimes uh, the patients are seen in the clinic and consented by some other uh, team. And then you, the trauma surgeon gets to see the patient on the day. Uh, is there any implications of consenting uh, one stage, two stage, or does it, is, it, is the whole patient journey taken as one experience? What is, what is the consent? See, in an ideal scenario, the consent should be obtained by the surgical team or the person who's going to do the surgery. But in the real life scenario, particularly in an NHS where we all have fixed job plans, fracture clinics on some days, operating on other days, I think it's, a, it's an ideal that is impossible to achieve. But so long as the person who has seen the patient in the fracture clinic has 
dealt with the topic adequately and um, then you go and you know see them just before surgery and confirm that the decision making was sound options have been explained patient does understand the risks and then proceed with the trauma operation i don't see how that should be a problem in fact that also happens in elective surgery sometimes you know you're on annual leave and your fellow lists a patient for surgery sometimes a fellow is on on annual leave you list for surgery but then the fellow does the operation in your absence so this is very common and i don't think we can avoid it so we just have to make sure that the process is robust and that we've um, sort of documented that that it is robust thank you so uh, there is a question for um, mr gudena so uh, there is a question which asks is there any upper age limit for um, doing labral repairs or is it just based on uh, the pathology um there is no age limit as such but if you look at the literature above 40 the hip arthroscopy doesn't uh, give great results because inherently they will have some arthritic changes in the joint but uh, certainly it all based on the severity of the arthritis as long as the joint space is well preserved i'll tell one of i have recently one of the patient been referred by my colleague uh, from liverpool she is 64 she had a labral repair and I followed her up at one year just a um, uh, couple of weeks ago. And she's doing very well. So th there is no age limit. It's the disease what she needs to look in particular. Thank you. There is a question for, I think I'll ask uh, Kuntal uh, this question. Uh, in uh, total hip replacements for uh, fracture neck of femurs, there is a question, is there any um, time limit to extend the precautions or do you... Uh, do you think they're more prone for dislocations? What is your view, Kuntal? I think there are enough studies out there to show that there is a higher risk, higher risk of dislocation in fractured neck of femurs. Uh, one clearly is that uh, they are not used to a stiff hip and therefore the, the, their expectations are, are of moving the hip and their quality of life, uh, you know, and that, you know, the, the, the compliance with hip precautions. Uh, is not great. So, so I always tell my patients that there's a much higher risk of dislocation and I quote a couple of papers that uh, are commonly used. Uh, precautions, what you can take? Well, um, you, you know, depends what um, we all use in our practice, but, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, the choice of approach, the choice of implants, think of dual mobility. Uh, a lot of units are using dual mobility uh, I don't actually use it as a routine practice for my acute neck of femurs. I still use a 28 head or a 32 head, uh, and that still works well in my hands. But think of a dual mobility solution uh, if, if you want to. Thank you. And, and uh, I'll probably ask my last question to Nikhil Pradhan. There is a question which says, why do Vancouver C have a high risk of failure or non-union? Nikhil, do you want to throw some light on that? C do not have a high rate of non-union. It is the type Bs, when you fix them, that they have a higher rate. So the Cs do reasonably well if they are well fixed. I think the important bit here is that if you've got a C which is close to your implant and your fixation is not adequate, so when you fix the proximal fragment that is not well fixed, then you'll end up with failure. So most of the failures that we see in type C's are probably technical, that you've probably not achieved very good fixation. So um, I would say, yes, look at healing potential, osteoporotic bones, and how you're going to fix it. But it is failure of fixation. As I said, it's a race between implant failure and fixation. Great, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Nikhil. You. Thank you. Prakash, can I just say something? Yeah, sure. I think we will. I'd like to thank all the presenters. It was really uh, excellent, informative talk. Thank you very much, personally, from my side and from all the delegates.